Okay, so welcome back everybody. Uh, do I have any tips on how to solve or start number two and three on the homework? Let me remind myself what uh, your homework number two and three, or yeah, the problems are. Um, so for, uh, for two, what I would say is that, uh, so for number two, um, I gave a description in lectures of how uh, Napier um, discovered the logarithm by uh, the motion that he was considering was motion starting at minus one and moving towards um, uh, uh, towards the positive direction towards the the y-axis um, and using that there was a you know there was a strange term that we got but ultimately it was a uh, log base uh, 1 over e, I think, of, of some stuff, right, called the Napier log. Um, so that was, that was how we got uh, uh, this Napier log was through that description of motion. So the question that number two uh, asks is how do you uh, want to have your particle moving to, instead of getting your base to be 1 over e, getting your base to be e. Um, Instead, and I, I don't care what's inside, you know, there's there might be some weird uh, term or some weird expression showing up here. Um, that doesn't matter to me. What matters is just that the base is E here. So uh, I suggest having a look at the lecture where I discuss the Napier log um, to maybe get an idea of how you would how you would do that. That's where I give the full description of this thing in terms of motion. Uh, for three. I would suggest that you, um, so for three, uh, I would just suggest that you um, come up with on your own some equations for, say, circles, hyperbolas, parabolas, these things, and just see how they match. So I'm just looking for a single example. So I'm just uh, looking for uh, particular examples. You don't have to give the, like, the general form. So, for instance, for a parabola, you don't have to give the general form a parabola has in the plane. You could just, you could just give me a particular parabola if you like. Okay. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's that's one um, thing I'll say about it. Other than that, there's some tricky <laughs> stuff here. Um, so. Uh, there are some degenerate cases here. So two parallel lines, that's a degenerate case. Uh, a point is a degenerate case. Uh, and the whole plane is a degenerate case. But don't... Just think, right? So if you're describing uh, these these equations in, in number three on the homework, is you're thinking of the set of all points x, y in the plane that satisfy those equations. So just try different values of, you know, of, of these things. So just try different values of A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and that means, you know, try, see what happens when you zero out most of those, or see what happens when you zero out all of those. Okay. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, for number one, which I figured most people would uh, find to be the, the toughest one, of these, uh, because you're you're finding a an exact solution, right? So I don't want um, uh, I don't want any uh, uh, you know, so no decimal approximations. You should have like the the exact uh, exam. I didn't say that. I should have said that in number one, but uh, I want the exact. Uh, uh, solutions. It turns out there's three real in that case. So in number one, you're in the case uh, uh, where there are three real solutions. Um, and so in our case breakdown in that supplemental video, this is the uh, the case I described where uh, I think I used Q and P. So Q squared minus P cubed is less than zero. Okay, um, and it will be helpful to you to think of q squared minus p cubed as minus some th real number squared. This shows up. Okay.
okay uh, so um, once you have written this case you can actually write out explicitly what um, once you realize you're in this case you can write out explicitly what uh, the uh, those roots have to be okay um, and you, so you can find out uh, exactly what uh, uh, these things are. So uh, anyway, uh, again, you know, if you can't get it done by tonight, that's no problem. Um, just uh, just uh, take your time, and you can ask more questions. You can email me more questions if you don't uh, if you don't get it finished by tonight. Uh, you can just wait, you know, to to submit it. Uh, your last homework assignment will kind of be a general, I will post it sometime later today, it'll be a kind of a general, uh, you know, write-up on some of these last mathematicians that we've done. Uh, for three, I plug the full equation into Desmos and set up sliders for each coefficient so I can see the different graphs when I change the values. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's that's cool. Um, yeah, so uh, you can actually, and that way you can actually see exactly what, uh, what is happening to these conics uh, as you change them. You can even... Um, you know, so what's cool is you can actually, um, uh, you could actually see, for instance, you know, when, uh, uh, when one of the ellipses would become like a, a circle, for instance, right? When, when an ellipse would become an actual, uh, circle, um, or, uh, when you could even, uh, it might be funny to see, uh, like a, um, a parabola, uh, morphing into depending on the how the plane is cutting a parabola morphing into a hyperbola or something so anyway um yeah uh that's the that's the the idea um okay so yeah so just let me know if you have questions uh more questions about that stuff like i said all, as always you know you don't have to worry about uh turn it in late or anything if you have more questions after you've worked on it a little bit more okay um, so I wanted to finish up, uh, some, uh, of Gauss's contribution. So as I mentioned last time, Theorema, uh, Agregium, this is, uh, this is his big contribution, which, um, which gave, uh, uh, really, it, it gave teeth to the geometry that Gauss was doing because it said that, um, you can do all the geometry you want on the surface and whatever geometry you're doing it's not just some weird thing that sits inside euclidean space and thus it's almost like a sub you know euclidean thing it can be considered entirely on its own uh there's no need to reference the ambient space so one thing that you get and one of the reasons i say that uh gauss it's funny that gauss you know didn't uh or you know wasn't able to fully write out like Lobachevsky and Bolyai did uh, a description of non-Euclidean geometry because using Gauss's work and the theorem of Gregium, you can actually come up with a surface that has the same geometry of that hyperbolic plane, right? So, uh, so we talked last time about the hyperbolic uh, upper half plane. That was... Uh, that was our example of non-Euclidean geometry. So that wasn't due to Gauss. Uh, you know, that was due to uh, Lobachevsky and Bolyai. But um, uh, you might say, well, okay, this, up, this hyperbolic upper half plane is just this weird, um, you know, uh, construction uh, done by these mathematicians. But it has no basis in anything that you might study, anything you might study, say, in the theory of surfaces. Uh, but that's not true. So uh, there is... Um, what's called the tractricoid. What is the tractricoid? The tractricoid is a surface, so you can double it to have a double surface that looks like this, or you can consider just half of it. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll do it like this. So... has like a middle thing that looks like this. So this is a surface. 
it looks something like this. I could actually give you a specific parameterization of this surface in the like calc three uh, sense, but I'm not going to do that. It involves like hyperbolic secant and stuff. And of course now, if you've been told previously, uh, if you've in your previous math studies, if you've encountered functions uh, like hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine, um, well. <laughs> There's a reason why they're called hyperbolic sine and cosine. Uh, and the reason they're called that is because they are used to define these, or they come up in the study of these quantities that turn out to be related to hyperbolic geometry. So, um, so there's this surface called the tractricoid. This surface has the exact same geometry. as the hyperbolic upper half plane. So here is, you know, as as well as we can do it, as well as we can talk about it, here is a real world example of this hyperbolic upper half plane type geometry, this hyperbolic geometry um, done uh, just directly from this surface. Now, how do I get this surface? It's an interesting historical thing, so I can't help but mention it. So it's called the tractricoid. Sometimes you'll, uh, probably the more common name now is to call it a pseudosphere. Um, I never liked calling it a pseudosphere because pseudosphere, like this thing is, it is not apparently anything like a sphere, so calling it a pseudosphere always seemed a little weird to me. There's a reason for it, but I just don't like the terminology at all. I much prefer tractricoid, because with tractricoid, as much as that's a mouthful, tractricoid itself um, tells you exactly where this thing comes from. Okay, so um, in this course, we've studied, or we have at least mentioned, a lot of these kinematic curves describe their motion. So one example of such a curve is called the tractrix. So what is the tractrix? Okay, so uh, this actually was something due to Leibniz. Okay, so what is Leibniz's uh, what is Leibniz's deal as concerns the tractrix? So Leibniz considered the following problem. Of his original problem may have been a donkey towing uh, towing a box, or I can't remember if it was a man towing a dog on a leash or a donkey towing a box. I think it was a donkey. So uh, here's the here's the problem. Okay, so say that you got the plane, right? You got the plane, and you got person here. Okay, so person here. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll draw person here. Okay, or person, donkey, whatever. And you have a box here. Box, object, whatever. Okay. And attached to that box from the person is string that is held taut Right? It is held, it's some fixed length rope or string or whatever that is tied to that box. Okay, and so this is a fixed length. This is a constant length. So this person is always holding it exactly as tight, okay, as they are currently. So they pull it tight and they're holding it at exactly that tightness. And then this person walks, right, walks exactly in the, along the x-axis, okay, in the negative direction, we'll say. Okay, so what path gets traced out when, what path does this object trace out under that motion? Well, as the person is walking, right, so after some amount, the person is here, and then the person is here. This length is going to be the same, so what happens is this. So maybe at this point we're, let me just estimate here, eh? Yeah, so maybe we're like here. 
I'm always in need of my stupid straight edge, and it's always on the other side of the room. And so here's my fixed length. Right, maybe same is true here. Okay. And I could do the same thing starting over here, walking in that direction. And I get a similar thing on this side. Right. And so the actual curve I get is called the Tractrix. And this is what it looks like. Okay. So, the tractorcoid. The tractricoid is the surface of revolution. So, if you recall from Calc 2, a surface of revolution, or maybe you did this in Calc 1, um, a surface of revolution of a curve. Uh, you can talk about taking a given curve and say... Uh, thinking about rotating it, right, out of the paper, say, around the y-axis or around the x-axis. You can talk about surfaces of revolution that are more complicated than that, uh, you know, r rotating this about some, like, l other transverse line or something. But let's just talk about either the y-axis or x-axis. If I take this curve and I think about rotating it or revolving it out of the paper around the x-axis, I get the tractor coid. So the tractor coid is the surface of revolution obtained by rotating the Tractrix. About the x-axis. Okay. And so, what we get is exactly this picture. So Leibniz was actually the first to describe the Tractrix. And the Tractrix is this weird curve described in this way. Turns out to be the thing that allows you to define a surface it's a concrete example of a surface that actually has hyperbolic geometry. So if you do the geometry of this surface in the way that Gauss was studying the geometry of other surfaces in space, this geometry is identical to that hyperbolic geometry that we introduced that had the weird uh, you know, upper half plane where lengths didn't really look the same, right? Some lengths look like they were short, but they were actually longer than some other lengths. Uh, that, that appeared longer, um, things like lines just didn't look right in our upper uh, half plane. So it turns out that um, you can very much exactly describe how the geometry of this tractor coid works, and it's an example of hyperbolic geometry. Okay. So, um, so that is a neat... Uh, fact and application of of this stuff is the tractrix related to the quadratrix uh it's not but a lot of these kinematic curves um have that tricks uh uh suffix uh so um there's uh uh what is the what is i guess the i'm not exactly sure the linguistic convention uh for that i'm not I'm not totally sure uh, why that is. That it, it is there's some uh, uh, linguistics uh, thing going on here. So actually, the Tractrix was named by um, uh, Huygens. So uh, even though Leibniz was the first uh, to, um, so Leibniz was the first to actually uh, give a full description. Uh, so Leibniz. Gave full description. So Leibniz gave full description, but uh, Huygens was the first to study it. And named it. Um, 
Yeah, I would have to think about the uh, I'd have to think about the linguistic convention behind most of these kinematic curves having the suffix tricks. And so it's not just there's quadratrix, there's uh, there's the tractrix, uh, there's um, uh, there's another one. There's at least one more that I'm forgetting. Uh, so yeah, I'd have to think uh, uh, about uh, about that, um, like where that comes from. Uh, so yeah, uh, Huygens named it. Actually, um, apparently. Uh, um, in German, uh, there's another name for this uh, called the uh, the Hundkurve, which is dog curve, uh, because of this idea of man has dog on leash and is towing dog along, right? Dog is like very uh, <laughs> stubborn and is just going along at the absolute like length of this leash, right? And what's the path of the dog? So this is the dog curve uh, in uh, in German. So uh, Leibniz study gave full description. Uh, the Bernoulli study, at least one Bernoulli, um, studied this thing. Uh, and Huygens, so now I actually get to talk about something that Huygens did um, that I mentioned previously but didn't get to uh, talk too much about it. Uh, so I mentioned before when we talked about Huygens that he uh, studied uh, evolutes of curves. Okay, so this is where the tractrix comes in. Okay, uh, and um, the the uh, catenary uh, or catenary, depending on your pronunciation in the English. So I think British people say catenary, and American mathematicians say catenary. Um, but uh, anyway, um, this is uh, uh, so the evolute of the tractrix. The tractrix evolute. I'm not going to describe evolutes and involutes of curves. You can have a look at those. So evolu if you look at the wiki article on evolute, I'm 100% sure that it will also talk about involutes. Um, so the tractrix evolute is a curve called uh, the catenary or catenary. So what is the catenary? Uh, let's just include it. But for completion's sake, what is this curve? You actually see this curve a lot, and you don't even realize it. So it's not a cycloid. Okay, it kind of looks like this. That's maybe not the best way, but it should hang a little bit lower, probably. Um, what is this curve? It is the curve traced out by a weighted chain under the effect of gravity. Okay. So, uh, if you have ever been to, I don't even know if they have this anymore. I know they, I think they got rid of it. But back in, back in the day, if you went to a movie theater, they would have roped off areas and the the ropes that they were used were these big fat like ropes that had velvet covers or whatever and so every single notch that they were connected to is just a bunch of these right any anywhere there's just some some heavy weighted connector thing that's just hanging suspended from two ends this is if the only force acting on it's just the gravity uh, this is the shape that it has this is not a parabola it's not a semicircle. It's not a cycloid. Okay. It's none of those things. It is absolutely a different curve. Okay. So if you evolute the tractrix, you get the catenary. Actually, the way I drew it makes it look more like a cycloid. If I drew this uh, a little bit better, maybe it would hang, like I said, a little bit lower. So maybe it would hang something like this. That maybe looks a little better. Okay. Okay. But uh, to answer your question directly, uh, the tractrix is not directly related to the quadratrix. Uh, the only thing uh, that it shares in common with it is that it's a kinematic curve. Uh, and the quadratrix was, I, is, I believe, the earliest kinematic curve uh, in history. So kinematic curve here just means a curve described through the motion of some objects. 
Um, another example of uh, an, a really early kinematic curve is the Archytas curve. Uh, so we studied, you know, Archytas was one of the teachers of Plato, uh, and Archytas uh, developed this weird three-dimensional curve. It's not even a curve in the plane. It's this weird three-dimensional curve called the Archytas curve. It was also described through um, through motion, and he used it to double the cube, or it was later used to double the cube. And this is another thing that Plato was, you know, super offended by because the Archytas curve he viewed as just being way too complicated. Okay, so that's that. Now, um, uh, Gauss had a student uh, that would go on to be extremely influential in many fields. So uh, Gauss's student, so Gauss's most famous student, was Bernard Riemann. So unfortunately, Riemann uh, was kind of a sickly guy. He was sick most of his life. Um, he, uh, so he ended up dying. I think he was only about 40 uh, when he died. So let me get his years. He was born in 1826. Yeah, and he died in 1866. Um, I think of tuberculosis or some basically lifelong struggle he had with respiratory problems. Um, so Riemann was, was kind of a sickly dude. Uh, the climate of Germany didn't help him uh, very much at all. So later on, uh, once he was kind of established already and had already gotten his PhD and had already done a bunch of work, um, to help his health, he moved to Italy, uh, you know, which had nicer weather uh, than Germany. It was thought that it would it would let him... Uh, you know, live a little bit more, uh, less miserable, um, and maybe improve his health. It ultimately didn't totally improve his health. He, he died in 1866. But because of his moving to Italy, um, you will notice if you study geometry of this era and of like the, the foundations of modern differential geometry, um, almost all of the names are Italian. So you will, you will come across, um, you will come across so many names uh, in the early um, in the early geometry stuff around this time, and like almost all of them are Italian. It's like 90% Italian names, uh, and the reason for that is when Riemann moved to Italy to help his health, he took on a lot of students that were extremely interested in his work in geometry, and those students would go on to be basically the founders of differential geometry as we know it now. Um, Gauss gets his name, he, his name creeps in too, so there's like the gauss codazzi equations. Uh, Codazzi is an Italian mathematician, a student of Riemann, who, um, who showed those equations. Gauss gets his name tossed in because he had essentially worked them out, just not in the same, uh, uh, not in the exact same form. So his most famous student was Riemann, so Riemann, uh, is an extremely influential mathematician. In fact, uh, you already have heard of his name, uh, not just from the Riemann hypothesis that I mentioned earlier, but from Riemann sums. So Riemann was extremely influential in uh, both analysis and geometry. So remember, analysis is now what we call calculus and where calculus heads. Okay, so let's start out with his analysis uh, uh, contribution. So Riemann was the first to rigorously define the integral. Okay. So he did this with Riemann sums. And it's absolutely amazing that it took until the 1800s for this to happen, right? So, um, so Leibniz and Newton were working in the late 1600s, early 1700s, um, and it, it, it the reason it's amazing that it took this long for it to happen is even though they were computing, right, these integrals, right, in the way in the style of Cavalieri or Wallace. Um, and even though they understood, obviously, that the, the tie-in between these integrals and area under a curve, um, 
the way that they did everything was so hand wavy and so uh not rigorous that it was very hard for people to make a lot of progress um uh like foundationally with the integral because it's its foundation just wasn't even there um it was very uh so it's amazing they were able to get a lot of great results but um like foundationally the there was nothing to do with the integral because it was so kind of nebulous and, and not so well defined Riemann defined it and showed uh, like a rigorous description of the integral and what was amazing is that this is basically uh, what Archimedes was doing right so in that I showed you all um, a write-up uh, one of the translations I have of uh, on the quadrature of the parabola um, that Archimedes published and the way that Archimedes dealt with area his method of exhaustion that was used by Europeans to eventually come up with the integral, um, you know, is not far off from Riemann, uh, Riemann's formulation of, of doing this. So you remember Riemann sums here. So what is a Riemann sum? The idea is that if I want to study the area under a curve like this, okay, and I have some interval from A to B, well, the idea is that I can partition this interval, okay, and an easy way to partition, of course, would be into equal parts. So let's say I've taken that integral, or this interval, and I've split it up into these parts. If I want to compute the definite integral from A to B of this function, we'll say that this is F, okay, this function F of X dx, this computes the area under F, right? on the interval a to b but what was Riemann's method of doing this Riemann's method was well I can just draw in an approximation of this area and why not approximate it with the easiest possible shape let's use rectangles and to use these rectangles I can I can define the height so the width is defined by how I've split up this interval the height of these rectangles is going to be defined by whatever functional value on these subintervals I want to order in order to determine the height. So it's it's up to me. I get to choose. But I just need to stay consistent for every rectangle. So there is the Riemann left sum. So there's the Riemann left sum, which is I take my rectangles as having height determined by the left vertex and where it touches the uh, the function. So for my next rectangle, it would look like this. My next one would look like this. And my last one would look like this. So I get four rectangles, right? R sub 1, R sub 2, R sub 3, and R sub 4. And so this integral could be computed if I sum, right, this the area of these rectangles. I'm going to use R for the area of those rectangles. So if I sum this from I equals 1 to 4, right, that is an approximation. So this approximates the area, right, this integral. Okay, so that's approximately equal to that. So notice sometimes these rectangles don't go high enough, so there's some areas they miss. Sometimes these rectangles go over the curve, right? So they would overestimate the area. But if I sum these areas, I'm going to get some estimation. I could do the Riemann right sum. I could do the upper sum. Upper sum is I always take the largest value of the function on every subinterval. That is really nice conceptually, but if you actually have to compute the upper sum, you would have to find the max and min, uh, or depending on whether you're doing upper or lower sum, you'd have to find either the max or min on every sub-interval, which could be really annoying. Okay, So conceptually, it, this has a lot of nice properties, but uh, it's not that great for actually doing these. There's the lower sum, which is exactly the same as the upper sum, except you use minimums instead of maxima. Uh, and then, of course, you've heard of, like, midpoint sums. Uh, you might have heard of more complicated uh, uh, changes here, like the trapezoid rule or Simpson's rule. These use uh, 
these use different shapes so like the trapezoid for instance instead of a rectangle to estimate this um, but Riemann was the first to really rigorously define this notion and then what do you how do you get the definite integral itself well if you've taken this and you've partitioned it into n pieces so that there are n of these rectangles you have a sum right from i equals 1 to n of the area of all those rectangles and of course i'm not going to write out what this would actually be but the, this area that you're computing of all these rectangles can be easily computed just from knowing the area of of rectangles right so the the length or sorry the width is always the same and the height is determined by the function okay so those are just functional values so you're going to be summing some functional values here well the idea is i take the limit as n goes to infinity of this sum so four rectangles is not going to be as accurate in general as taking 10 rectangles here or taking 20 rectangles or 200 rectangles if you start doing that if you break these rectangles up into s smaller and smaller pieces notice what happens to the estimation look how close you get right filling this in with smaller rectangles look how close you are to the curve you're not massively overestimating anymore you are extremely tightly fitted okay all right so if you take the limit as n goes to infinity this is or you can define the definite integral from a to b of a function to be exactly that limit okay so that was due to Riemann uh, and for this notion uh, this integral from a to b of f of x dx this method of of integrating in fact unless you all have had uh, kind of some uh, more advanced analysis courses the only method of integration that you're familiar with is known as Riemann integration or the Riemann integral okay this wouldn't be uh, changed or improved upon or generalized uh, until the 1900s. So in 1902, uh, a French mathematician by the name of uh, Henri Lebeg um, published a dissertation that contained in it a description of something called a Lebeg integral. And so uh, if you're a grad student taking an analysis course in math, um, you are studying Lebeg integrals. Uh, there is also an intermediate integral uh, called a Borel integral that's like, kind of like between a Lebeg integral and a and a Riemann integral, but um, uh, the Lebesgue integration is kind of the the cutting edge <laughs> of of integration theory um, at the moment. So, uh, but anyway, so this was uh, this is not, of course, at all Riemann's only contribution, but it's one that uh, that you're well aware of that you've seen in some form. Um, so Riemann also defined the Riemann zeta function which was this sum uh, from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the s here where s is a complex number now uh, this has to do with a study a study of a field called complex analysis as opposed to real analysis so real analysis is the study of functions of a real variable which is what you're used to from calculus complex analysis is study of functions of a complex variable um, so the thing about uh, complex analysis is because you're less familiar with it uh, and because co dealing with complex numbers in general is something you're less familiar with you might immediately think that complex analysis is nastier or more complicated than real analysis um, but in a sense it's real analysis that's the bad one uh, because in complex analysis there's a lot of theorems and facts that are simply not true in real analysis so for instance in complex analysis there's a notion of a derivative just like there's a notion of derivative that you're used to or familiar with um, and in complex analysis having one derivative means you have all derivatives uh, and it also means that 
you have a power series representation, uh, which is uh, a property of a function known as analytic. So an analytic function is a function that has a power series uh, expansion. Uh, and that's a really, really nice function. That is, so people like Newton, Leibniz, uh, Euler, um, they thought that all functions were analytic. They thought all these functions had power series expansions. Um, and of course, there's some that don't, like e to the minus 1 over x squared, say. Right? So like uh, e to the minus 1 over x squared is a real uh, is a real function that is not analytic. But in complex analysis, if you have a function that has a derivative, it's automatically has infinitely many derivatives and it's automatically analytic. Um, so it has power series expansion. Definitely, definitely not true for real analysis. Here, there's the example, right? This function tells you why you can't have nice things in real analysis. Uh, this is this is bad. It has infinitely many derivatives, right? Away from zero. It's got infinitely many derivatives. Does not have power series expansion. Okay, so this is the counterexample to that fact that is a basic fact in complex analysis that's simply not true in real analysis. So a lot of times people will say that complex analysis is actually a lot prettier and a lot more convenient and simpler in a lot of ways than real analysis, which might seem surprising. Okay, but anyway, uh, in the study of complex analysis, there's the study of how you can extend a function Okay, uh, from being a function of a real variable to a complex variable, how you can extend it to being a complex valued function or a function of a complex variable. And that is one way of defining, that's how you define this Riemann zeta function. Uh, and we saw that this Riemann zeta function is uh, tricky because, for instance, uh, zeta of 2, right, is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared, which is pi squared over 6, right? This was the Basel problem, right? And zeta of 3 is uh, unknown. Okay. So even zeta of 3 is unknown, any kind of closed form description of this thing. There are estimates for it. You can look up approximations, but there's no co closed form description of what this number is. So this is unknown. Okay. Uh, there is the Riemann hypothesis, which is uh, a conjecture made by Riemann himself. It's probably, it's one of the oldest, it might be the oldest open problem in analysis. Um, almost certainly is. So what's the Riemann hypothesis? Um, Riemann claimed that all non-trivial zeros of the zeta function uh, lie on a certain line. So this hypothesis, this conjecture that Riemann made, has now been checked with the aid of computers for like the first so many trillion zeros that show up. I don't know exactly the state of the art on it, but it's a, it's a ton. Um, a ton of these satisfy the Riemann hypothesis. So this is true for, you know, a bunch of these, like billions of these zeros. Uh, and so, um, of course, that's not a proof. Uh, that's maybe just more and more evidence that it's very likely to be true. Um, the reason why this is uh, so important, and this is one of the Millennium Prize problems, uh, is a proof of it might, not necessarily, but might lead to all kinds of crazy applications outside of this because there's, there's a lot of tie-in between the zeta function and the distribution of prime numbers, which of course is very important for things like number theory and cryptography. And so uh, there's a possibility that uh, if the proof of the Riemann hypothesis, if the Riemann hypothesis is true and it's provable, a proof of it could yield some new insights into distribution of the primes that might uh, make, you know, certain problems attacking, say, cryptography. I mean, you know, like for me, what's the most interesting is just uh, the, you know, 
pure mathematical applications, but it could, you know, even lead to applications to cryptography and breaking encryption. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's just one of the ways in which the Riemann hypothesis is important, but, um, independent of all of that, independent of encryption entirely, Riemann hypothesis is really, really, uh, interesting and important. And if you were to show either that it was true or false, if you were to provide a proof or counterexample, it would make you probably the most famous mathematician in the world. So it's uh, something to aspire to. Um, okay. So Riemann, uh, also contributed massively to geometry. So he contributed massively to geometry. Um, he remember he was a student of Gauss, right? And so he was very very well aware of all of the Gaussian type calculations that had been done for curves and surfaces. Uh, and so this led him to uh, define a way of doing geometry that would become uh, known as Riemannian geometry. So he founded the study of what is now called Riemannian geometry. Okay. This is a generalization of geometry. Rather than thinking of it as non-Euclidean, Riemannian geometry is a way of thinking about geometry that includes Euclidean geometry. But of course, it also includes non-Euclidean geometry. So this includes Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry. All right. It doesn't quite include all to all sorts of geometry that can be done, but um, this is general enough to be. This is the setting for general relativity. I, I mean, this is the setting for relativity. Period. Um, so this would. Uh, this is the setting of relativity. And I mean, it's the it's the current you know cutting edge state of the art setting for modern theoretical physics and and, and cosmology. So this is uh, this is this is it. Um, Riemannian geometry and versions of Riemannian geometry. So there's a slightly more general type of uh, geometry called semi-Riemannian geometry, um, which uh, is basically just a slight weakening of one of the conditions of Riemannian geometry, but very, very similar. Um, and so, uh, this, this is, uh, this is, you know, an amazing subject. If you study Riemannian geometry, it basically won't be, um, until you're in grad school, uh, because a problem with geometry more generally, right. And this is a problem very relevant to the history of why the Greeks had such difficulties with some things that they really wouldn't have struggled with otherwise it was just that they were trying to do everything with geometry uh, and that's that geometry is just very hard um, and the reason it's very hard is that to properly understand what's going on requires a ton of knowledge about a bunch of different fields and the way that things interact so dealing with a lot of things geometrically is just tough it's 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 a really challenging problem and so to understand Riemannian geometry takes a decent breadth of knowledge uh of uh, analysis and a little bit of topology too um, that I had mentioned a little bit previously. What is basically the idea here? So the idea is um, this kind of the fundamental quantity, right? That you might think of in geometry. And now we have, we're a post Descartes world. So I have coordinates here. So, uh, right. The distance between points A and B, right? So computing that distance, the distance between A and B, that's kind of a big deal in geometry, being able to compute distances. Okay, but if we label these with coordinates, of course, you already know how to do this. So if A is x1, y1, and B is x2, y2, the distance between A and B is 
square root of uh, x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. Where does this come from? It's just the Pythagorean theorem, right? If I drew in the triangle here in question, it's exactly the Pythagorean theorem applied to that triangle that I just drew in. So this is just directly from the Pythagorean theorem. But there's another way of seeing what this distance is. So another way of seeing what this distance is, is take two vectors associated to the points A and B. So we'll call those vectors uh, V1 is the one associated to A, and V2 is the one associated to B. Okay, now vectors are points and points are vectors. So associated to the point A is the vector V1, associated to the vector V1 is the point A. So in the plane, in space, wherever vectors show up, vectors and points are really the same object. But it can be simpler sometimes to think of vectors and the associated calculations you can do with vectors. So there's another way of thinking about this distance. And that other way is um, noticing that uh, if I look at this, V1, right? So V1 is uh, x1, y1, that's that point. V2 is x2, y2. Okay, um, so what really is this? Well, um, this is like I took the vector v1 minus v2, which I can get by just subtracting in both slots. So this is uh, x sub 1 minus x sub 2, y sub 1 minus y sub 2. So I take this vector, and then what do I do with it? Well, I could dot it with itself and then take the square root. So if I take this vector, v1 minus v2, and I dot it with itself, so the dot product of two vectors, so if I take v1 and v2 and I dot them together, this takes the components and multiplies, so x1 times x2, plus y1 times y2. This is known as the dot product, or scalar product, or Euclidean product, okay? It's usually just called the dot product. If I take the dot product, what do I get? I get uh, the dot product of this thing with itself. I get x1 minus x2 times x1 minus x2, so I get x1 minus x2 squared. Uh, plus y1 minus y2 times itself, so that's y1 minus y2 squared. That's not exactly what I have here. I need to take the square root. Now we're good. Okay, now we're good. So if I dot a vector with itself and take the square root, right, that is the same as finding distance, right? That's the same as computing distance. Okay. Um, what does that have anything to do with anything, right? Well, I can simplify the notion of distance by just talking about the length of a vector. And so it turns out that the length of a vector v is the same thing as the square root of the vector v dotted with itself. Okay. And that is just this computation that we did. Okay. Now, you could look at that and say, wow, that's a, okay, that's a cool identity. All right, and that's, and that's that, right? I know that about the dot product. But a better way to look at this is to say the following. The dot product is the thing that makes computing length possible. That might... You might look at this and say, okay, I barely have even heard of the dot product until, you know, I got to I got to a certain level in math, so or maybe I hadn't heard about the dot product at all. The point is I'm looking at this and I'm saying that suddenly this is the thing that I didn't even know about that was making it possible to compute length. The answer is yes. You didn't know about it, but it was hiding in plain sight. It was it was hiding in this formula that it's the dot product that's actually allowing you to do this. So on the Euclidean plane and in Euclidean space, there's the dot product. This is our way of computing length. Okay, and that dot product allows all the length that you know of to be computed, and that, that computing length in that way 
uh, and computing angles in the usual way. That's me doing Euclidean geometry. That's how this works. Okay, so um, what was Riemann's idea? And uh, as I said, Gauss had done some of this on surfaces. So I'm going to show this for surfaces, but Riemann applied this not just for surfaces, but for also for higher dimensional uh, spaces. So the idea is, say you have some surface, and who knows, it could be really curved. Maybe it's even like the tractrocoid, right, earlier. Okay, but the point is that this surface that you're studying ideally is going to be uh, something called a manifold. Okay, what is a manifold? This is a fundamental geometric object study, uh, and the easiest way to think about it is it's uh, locally, it looks like Euclidean space. So, looks like here is hand wavy. This looks like Euclidean space or the Euclidean plane in the case of a surface. Uh, so, what does that mean? That means if I look at a single point here, there is a plane near that point, right, that approximates like points that are close to that point. Well, you know what plane that is, right, that I just drew. That's the tangent plane to this surface at that point, which you spent some non-trivial portion of Calc 3 figuring out how to compute. So I have tangent planes at various points on the surface, okay? So we'll say here's my, here are my tangent planes, all right? And so... Um, the idea is that each of these planes, if I just look at the planes now, is no different from the Euclidean plane, really. And so, these tangent planes are similar to my Euclidean planes. So I can define dot products on them. Okay, so I can define a dot product over here. So here's vectors in my plane, u and v. I can talk about u dot v here. And then on this plane, now this is a different plane. These are, this is a different point, so I have different vectors here. Maybe we'll use uh, W, right? W and um, Z even, right? There we go. And so I'm going to have a different dot product over here. So Z, I'll write it as Z like star W, but this is a different dot product that allows me to compute lengths over here. This U dot V over here allows me to compute lengths here. I can define these different dot products on these different planes. I could do that for all points. So Riemann's idea is that, but... I need to consistently allow passage between these different tangent planes. And I'm going to call these different tangent planes tangent spaces. So I need to consistently allow passage between these different tangent spaces. So there's a tangent space here at this point. If this is the point P and this is the point Q on the surface, there's the tangent space of, if I'm calling my surface S here, there's the tangent space to S at the point P, there's the tangent space to S at the point Q. In the case of a surface, the tangent space is a plane. This plane is identical to Euclidean plane, so I can define dot products on it, but I'm because these are entirely different planes, the dot products are te technically different. And so I have to come up with a way of, as I pass between points on this surface, being able to tie together these different notions of dot product. Okay, This is codified in a concept known as a Riemannian metric. This is what the Riemannian metric does. 
So the Riemannian metric does just this. And a manifold equipped with a Riemannian metric is called a Riemannian manifold. And this is the central object of study in Riemannian geometry, uh, which is like the your stepping stone, your starting point to uh, differential geometry in general. Okay, went over a little bit too long, but that's, that gives pretty much uh, the full description of, of what's going on here. Uh, at least, uh, you know, in as, uh, as quick uh, of a way of trying to describe these things as possible. Uh, next time I'm going to mention uh, Felix Klein uh, and so one more German geometer um, that and his uh, what's called the Erlangen program, which is a really interesting way of viewing geometry backwards. Um, and uh, then I'm going to do some foundational stuff. Uh, and then on the last day of class, I will um, maybe talk a little bit more about some of the analysis stuff that I talked a little bit about earlier uh, and that's uh, that'll be that that'll be the course so anyway um, I will see you all on Friday uh, like I said if you have questions about the homework just let me know all right and I'll uh, and don't don't worry about handing it in uh, if you're not done yet you can always take a little bit of extra time so anyway I will see you all next time